the following Thank is a comfortably zoned radio yeah, network that goes production. To me too. Yeah, and um, thrilled that uh, you're doing this. We missed you this morning for a while. You were tardy. You were taking a nap because you didn't nap, nap yesterday. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Tell us that story. Tell us what, what your day was like without a nap. Well, first I met with, uh, uh, every Saturday morning I meet with a group of guys, and uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to go yesterday, uh, but my daughter said, it's your birthday, go ahead, go. So luckily I did because uh, one of the guys had bought a balloon <laughs> and attached it to the chair that I sit in on Saturday and bought a card and had the other guy sign it. So it would have been uh, uh, not nice if I hadn't shown up. So I, yes. So I did, and then I then I spent a number of hours with my daughter and my grandkids, and then I went to a wedding. Really? And somebody? Yeah, I, somebody I didn't know. You just crashed so it. Did. Well, just well, about. He was emulating what you did last week. Yes. Exactly, exactly, because we had talked about credit yeah. wedding two weeks ago. So uh, actually my, 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 the, the widow of my friend Steve Landisbury, oh, she yeah. was officiating at a wedding, and uh, she asked if I would, like, be her escort, so to speak, for oh. the day, so I did. She is she an ordained uh, rabbi or something? Oh, you can you can get ordained for just the day. Oh, really? Yeah, you know, yeah, like like my friend Rick Podell, who they yeah, was, he officiated at my son's wedding. No kidding. Yeah, and my daughter is a woman that she knows. She did my daughter's wedding. Yeah, I don't know what you you call somebody and you, you and you get a piece of paper or not even and you can marry someone. That must be a California law. I've never heard of anything like that. I had never heard of it either until uh, my, my daughter's wedding. Huh? You can uh, make a good. You can make a few bucks on a weekend. Sudden, hmm. You know, you can make a few bucks on a weekend. Well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh so she she was if she she did the wedding and and uh it was very nice and and uh there were a lot of women there. Oh. A lot of women in beautiful dresses, some fairly tight and I was going. So here I am at 38. Boy, <laughs> do I miss being young. Oh my God! I know, I know. Oh, yesterday was. I yeah, I know. I yeah, I can't keep going to those weddings. I mean, I want know, to ask you both: What age do you, if you didn't know any better, and you just in your own head, what age are you? Start with you, David. Well, I'm soon. I'm soon going to be uh, celebrating my. Uh, 50 no, no, no. It, not your chronological age. The age you are in your own head. Oh, about uh, eighteen. Eighteen. Okay. I could just drive. Just started to drive. Mm. Oh, my wife could vouch for that. She thinks doesn't think I'm a good driver. <laughs> but I, but I started to say was you know the, uh, like Mike. We all, all of us, all of the guys. The guys from the Bronx. All of us were born within uh, days of each other. In fact, uh, my close friend Stanley also had his birthday yesterday. Um, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah. Stanley Newman? Yes, Stanley Newman. Oh, happy birthday. Yeah, well, yeah. Uh, but so I, was, so I, too, will be having a birthday uh, in a week, and I'm going to be celebrating my 59th birthday. Okay. Because that was a good year. I had a wonderful year that year. And I like to celebrate. Yeah, so I'm going to celebrate it. My 50th birthday was very nice. That's that's how, that's good. I yeah. 
is to be right you know back. The story I'm going to tell you my parents wife Buick guys and stuff. What? I'm going to go away for a moment, okay? Okay. Okay. I'll be right back. Come back. All right. You know, David, the story is not your grandfather's Buick or this, that, or the other thing. Yeah, right. Um, how, if you could put into words, how is it that your extended middle life, middle age, let's say, and mine extended middle age, is different from, if not your grandfather, but your grandfather's age, your grandfather's era, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, first of all, my the only one of my two grandfathers that I knew uh, was my mother's father. I'm sorry, that's okay. And that was, and he, that was my that was my ex-wife. Oh, wishing you a happy birthday. Yes. Yeah. She now lives in the mountains. <laughs> she said I can't call her back because she's in the <laughs> mountains. She's Huh. She's, I don't know, she's become like Annie Oakley. She's, she has a pony, a truck, and lives in the mountains. I swear. Wow. To God. wow. Who the hell did I marry? <laughs> that's, that's and, and an arsenal of like walking weapons. up a hill and she's living in mountains. <laughs> shooting wild animals and uh, no. shooting down trees. I don't, I don't know. Where were we? Oh, so you want to well, be 59? Y- yes, because I said that was a very good year. I had a very good year, my 59th. You know, I celebrate that just about every year. Um, when my I birthday think I would around. go back to, oh, 20, when I was 28. But, you know, you, uh, but Ralph was just asking me about, you know, how I differ in, in my age and attitude at, uh, to that of my my grandfather, and I was saying the only one of the two that I knew um, was a an immigrant. He came over from what we believe was Poland at the time. It might have been Czechoslovakia, Austro Austro Hungarian Empire. Really, um, my only living cousin from uh, from that side of the family. Uh, he can't recall it. I can't recall it precisely. But, you know, he came over as a young man, and he did very well for himself. Um, but he, he, he remained, I mean, he was a wonderful man to me. I was the first grandchild, so he was a wonderful man to me. If I needed anything, like a basketball, or I think I, I told the story how he, he went out and got me spurs. I needed spurs. Um, spurs? <laughs> yes, well, you know, there was, there was a horse stable up there on, remember the horse stable up on Gun Hill at the end of the... Yes, uh, I do. Uh, right. So, every, you know, if you wanted to ride a horse, you had to get the spurs. So I had to have a pair of spurs. So I got the spurs, and he, I got a basketball, too, but not at the same time, because you can't really play basketball in spurs. Um, you get caught. You can play, but not, you can't play well. You can't, well, no, not only can't you play well, but you get caught for a lot of uh, penalties because, you know, you, right, you're stabbing that. these poor guys with your spurs. Yeah, but anyway, well, um, but driving that home, the yeah, driving to the basket, you know, with your spurs jingling and jangling <laughs> like, <laughs> like you know what you're saying or somebody. But um, the diff- the, the, there's a tremendous difference between how our grandparents lived and how first i mean you know it's a whole different universe and as michael was pointing out you know all these lovely young women at the wedding well we had the same thing at at the wedding we went to in ohio and it was really funny because uh my 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 wife went along with the uh the bride's mother the the bride and her closest friends were going to have a um a, 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 a bridal uh what do you call it a bachelorette party uh, but not in Columbus. They were having it in New Orleans. So the, br- the bride's mother said to Becky, please, you know, come along. We need a little more adult supervision here, and I don't want to be the only, you know, older woman there. So Becky, my my wife, went with her to New Orleans. And these five or six uh, late, I guess late 20s uh, young women uh, were there. So when we got to the wedding, 
they all greeted her with these big smiles and hugs. And, you know, I'm thinking, gee, you know, I should have gotten along, too. <laughs> yeah, who knows what went on? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, but I understand the feeling because this happens every time uh, I go to a wedding now. You know, there are always lovely young women there. And I don't remember any young single women at any of the, the weddings I went to when I was their age. Um, I guess because, you know, they were there. They must have been there, but they were, I guess, either married, engaged, or untouchable. And uh, I don't know, but uh, it's such a different world out there now. Oh, boy. Grandparents. Grandparents don't even, you know, they would have no, no concept. They wouldn't recognize it. No, no, they wouldn't. Um, they certainly wouldn't recognize the political scene. And oh. tr even Trump, notwithstanding, I don't think they would have rec recognized, um, say, a, a Cheney Bush regime where um, things went down as as they did. That was. Well, yeah, again. but but don't forget they all they all they all came through the depression, which left lasting marks on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, my I, I I've mentioned in the past my father worked for uh, Merrill Lynch and he lost his job in the stock market crash, and then uh, he wound up working for Bear Stearns and Company long before it collapsed. But he, he that in a way it soured him. He never. He would never invest in stocks after the stock market mm. crash. Now, I mean, not that he had a great deal of money to invest, which he didn't, and that was the reason he didn't for the permanent. He said, if you can't afford to lose it, don't play the stock market. Right. And he was right, right about that. Um, but, you know, it was, it's a, it was a whole different time. They, had, they went through the Hoover administration and Calvin Coolidge, and um, mm. everything was different. Really different. It's I mean, interesting that my father's idea was uh, if you can't afford to pay cash for it, don't buy it. Well, yeah. Oh, my parents my parents are the same way. Much the same way uh, with the stock. If you can't, The idea, you're not going to go out on a limb for something if you can't afford to buy I it. I think that may have been more universal than I even imagined at the, at the time. But I know my... my my parents wouldn't have bought anything. They didn't have a credit card. They they saved up the money when they would need a car, and then they bought the car. I, um, I don't remember there being credit cards when I was a kid in the in the late fifties, early sixties. Were um hmm. were there credit cards when you guys got got jobs? Were you offered credit cards in in I don't 1960s? think so. I don't either. Yeah. Do you remember anybody, like, you know, nowadays you go on the college campus, like in September, and all of these guys are out there offering credit cards, you know, and uh, you get a T-shirt or something with your application oh. for, for a credit card. Mm -hmm. And, of course, it's a trap because these kids are away from home for the first time, and the one thing they're going to need is a, a line of credit, you know, that puts them in debt for the mm -hmm. next 35 years. And, and plus, the student loans are absolutely yeah. killing yeah. people. They go through their whole lives being in debt. And, but, um, yeah, I'll tell you what happened. I'll tell you what happened this week, which made me very proud of my alma mater. NYU became the first oh, school. Oh, wow. Did you read that? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Uh, free tuition for the medical school, school students. That's phenomenal. Yes, and do you realize how many applications more they will get now because of that? Oh, my God. I mean, they'll be waiting through them. For, you know, a anybody who has any intention of going to medical school is going to apply there on the you know, sure. assumption that, you know, lightning may strike and I might get in. <laughs> and, so and they will have to apply. That's what I said. I said, where was it when I was at NYU? I could have gone to medical school. I could have been ending yeah. a brilliant career as a surgeon. Right about now. <laughs> oh, doctor! <laughs> but no, no seriously. I mean, that uh, at the wedding yesterday, and I wonder if you uh, uh, the same thing at the wedding you went to, David. The music that was played. Uh, well, you, well, 
No, first of all, ours was a, a, a very international wedding because the groom was from Argentina, and uh, oh. but there, uh, yeah, there were an Argentinian Jewish family, as there are many of in Buenos Aires. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hitler, for that one, and um, the um, the um, the music was mixed. I'd say, you know, some Latin tunes, some uh, old favorites, and some uh, some modern stuff, um, all blended in together. It was a very interesting wedding, um, with a couple of interesting side notes. Uh, the groom, uh, due to no circumstances of his own, uh, when the family emigrated from Buenos Aires years ago, uh, the attorney that did their paperwork uh, for uh, applying for U.S. citizenship, left him off the list. He was a, he was a young child at the time. Inadvertently, he left him off the list. So the, so the groom um, is not a U.S. citizen, while his parents are all U.S. citizens now. So the oh, only way, well, so he, he will have to leave the country shortly and go back oh. to Buenos Aires and then reapply. Now, the catch is that you're not... According to the law, you're not supposed to, you can't apply for five years Whoa. from the last time you had it. So, and of course, the, with Trump and, and his machinations, we don't know, they don't know, um, you know, usually if you marry an American, they, they'll do a background check and they'll give you, uh, you know, entrance uh, and an ability to become a U.S. citizen down the road. Mm -hmm. Um, and we don't know if that's going to happen, and they don't know if that's going to happen. So, oh, yeah. have recourse against that attorney? I'm sure he's. Not I don't there. know. I don't. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I do know that the family was there because they live now in Oregon, and he's a professor at a university there, um, and they just have to come across. So when prior to this, uh, the wedding and everything, uh, for and I don't remember. I don't recall how far back this goes. But when he wanted to see his family and they wanted to see him, they had to meet like in Mexico City. Mm. Yeah, because he couldn't go back into the States. So it's, 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 they look like a very, very happy couple, very um, copacetic, but um, they're going to have to wait. He's hanging over their heads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sad. Said, but yeah, lots of people start weird. out, you know, lots of people start out the, in their married life with uh, obstacles to overcome. Most of them think that it made them stronger later on. So mm. we'll see. Is money, you guys have been married for a lot of years. I've been married in the past. Um, is money with everybody the biggest obstacle that married couples have to go through? I think it is. What do you think? I, I think pillows. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have the right pillows, when you lie down and you're gonna, then you're gonna make love and stuff, and then afterwards you want to lie back. And if you don't have Which the right pillow? pillows, it's I, just I'm envisioning that other thing in ways that you know uh, you're you. probably telling it, Michael, and that uh, makes us both a little strange. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I never had enough money to determine. <laughs> right. Buy a pillow. <laughs> no, I, in fact, I did buy a pillow. I got a really good deal on one just the other day at Macy's because I didn't like the one I had. It was a $7 Ralph Lauren pillow, and it's wonderful. It's really oh. great. It was on sale. On seven, how can you lose for 7 bucks? $7? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I almost went back uh, to buy another one. I mean, one was enough. You can't get a candy bar hardly for seven. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, we stopped at this, uh, on the way out to Ohio, we stopped at this uh, roadside in gas station, you know, sandwich shop. Um, at the people at the next table, these two giant mountain men with, you know, ponytails and uh, biker jackets. I mean, really, they're, I mean, they're out there in the middle of western Pennsylvania. And they, they looked apart. The Their Harleys were parked outside. But... Uh, you know, you, you go into it, it's a whole different world when you, you, you know, if you don't stop, it's like the, it's like the flyover of the states, you know, and all this. Mm -hmm. But if you if you drive it, you man, you come across some really 
strange people out there in, in western Pennsylvania. <laughs> oh, I tell you. I mean, I, I, wouldn't I wanna... didn't know that um, they were as strange as they are. I, uh, you, I, well, you don't want to tangle with Like them. that coming from the south. You could understand it, but... Um... Oh, yeah, but you don't. Uh, in fact, uh, later on, uh, driving home, we stopped uh, f- for lunch, and uh, this was uh, actually this was in Maryland, uh, Western Maryland, which is another world from Eastern Maryland, you know, than Baltimore and places like that. And sure enough, there was this guy, I mean, he must have been about 6'5", and with a full beard, just like you know, you see a wood chopper, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and and he had a ponytail, and his wife was there, and the two kids, and it was Sunday. It was a Sunday afternoon, um, and they were having lunch. Uh, they were having the. I guess they, this is what they, this was a uh, one of those chain restaurants, and uh, I guess this is where you go uh, on a Sunday for your Sunday dinner or whatever you would call it, Sunday. Brunch, brunch, whatever, yeah. Right, right. And they're all over the place out there, man. They don't, <laughs> I, it's true. I mean, <laughs> I was out there once in the, in Western Maryland with uh, a friend of mine. We were driving out to Cleveland, and we stopped in this place early in the morning because we hadn't had breakfast. And, I mean, it was like walking into deliverance. <laughs> I'm not kidding. These people, are, the, you know, one of them even had a tooth. I think they split it and they moved it around, you know, so they could all chew on it. Whatever. They were these people were. Re- That's my, funny. That's <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so they my friend ate. The tooth. So they shared the family shared it. Yes, yes, and uh, my friend Dave said, "God, if they ever find out we're Jewish, we're dead." You know. So we quickly ate and left. But that was oh man, that was really that was really a wild scene. They must have been hunters out looking, you know, uh, getting ready to go hunt or something because they weren't heading into the hospital to work in the surgery department. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, when you drive, after, when you make a long drive like that, you run into really strange, sometimes interesting people. Yes. Different than you, we grew up with. Absolutely. The Bronx. Absolutely. It's a whole other world. Yeah, no question about it. All right, guys, this was uh, terrific this morning. I'm glad you're back healthy, David. And um, and happy birthday, happy Michael. Birthday again, yes. Um, I almost was tempted to break into song. But, uh, <laughs> people would Any not particular like that. song? Or... That, no, I will mouth the words, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. And that's, um, I mean that without having to sink it. Um, All right. We'll be back next week. Thank you, guys. Enjoy your nap today, David. No, I'm not going to. Or Michael, rather. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'm sorry I was late, but at least. All right. Well, well, no, that's all right. We we may do, as it were. Be well, guys. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Next week. Okay. The show is Bronx Roots. the network is the Comfortably Zoned Radio One. And I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link of it all. Adios, David Hubbler. Adios, Michael, not Pomerantz. <laughs> I mean, sure. I gave, that, I gave the Pomerantz thing up. It, Good for it you. took me a long time. Smacked it right out of my head. Be well, guys. Okay. Bye-bye. See you next week, everybody. We are back, In Case You're Wondering, with George. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. Let me introduce the panel. David Hubler is here. Hi, good morning, all. Hey, David. Al Blumkin, how are you, sir? Hello there, everybody. Okay, and Ronnie Rabinovich is here to talk. How are you doing, Ralph? Good, Ronnie. How are you? Good, thank you. Beautiful. George Case, who is, uh, in my eyes, Mr. Athletic Shoe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, Ralph. 
<laughs> oh, well, you know, I you know that's bad. <laughs> hey, Ronnie. You're, uh, for those of you out there who don't know it, George um, had one hell of a career. You were listed in the Nike book of, um, hey, tell us about that, that you could do it in your words. <laughs> Well, that was a couple of years ago, not more than a couple of years ago. I'm showing my age now. It was about 20 years ago, and I'd been out uh, making some sales calls with one of my salesmen out in uh, Minnesota, and uh, the store owner said, hey, George, he said, I got a new Nike book, and he said, you're you're in it. And I said, what? And he said, yeah. He said, here it is. And he showed it to me, and uh, it was when I was in the athletic footwear business before Nike even started, and and they sort of took their uh, their cues from what I had done in the athletic footwear business to get into basketball. So that's where it came from. And, you know, I asked the owner, I said, geez, would you mind if I had the book? He said, oh, no, I'd be happy to give it to you. So I took it home and showed it to my children. And, uh, you know, it was, it was sort of a nice compliment to me because uh, they had mentioned, uh, you know, my ideas about the basketball shoe business is what they used as a – blueprint for them to get into the basketball shoe business because at the time Nike was only a, a running shoe company. Whoa. Was that, was that um, in Minneapolis, George? Yeah, it was. It was one of the, uh, I think it was one of the sporting goods stores up there and uh, sure. you know, they might not even be there anymore, Ronnie, because right. the business has changed so much. But, right, you right. know, this was a you know, an independent store owner. We just happened to be walking in there because we were going to talk about basketball shoes, and you know, it it, it got him to thinking about what he just read in the Nike book because he was a Nike dealer, and uh, you know, he, he wanted to show it to me. So I was uh, I was quite flattered to tell you the truth. That's great. That's great. Well, you didn't even call me for lunch, George. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know you that. <laughs> George, speaking of your clients. Um, you, you used to call on Pearson Sporting Goods in Philadelphia. Right, right. And um, they were owned by Red Pearson and his brother. And his sons were campmates of mine back in Kittatinny years ago in the Poconos. And I just wanted to tell you that you're talking about uh, dating ourselves. Um, Stanley Pearson and his lovely wife, Gail Pearson, who I knew when I was seven years old. These are people who just celebrated their 50th anniversary together, mm. and um, I just wanted to make note of that. And you knew them, um, you knew him, he's Stanley, and um, just wanted to make note of that for everybody. Well, you know, Ralph, if you ever talk to Stanley from now, you know, from this point, uh, just tell him I offer my congratulations to him. <clears throat> Stanley and I spent a lot of time together. As a matter of fact, <laughs> one year uh, he and I were playing customer golf, and, uh, you know, Stanley loved to play golf. But I was a terrible golfer. So I said, yeah, Stan, I'll go out with you. So first hole I think I birdied, and the second hole I think I parred. And after that, I just blew up because I was a terrible golfer. And Stan, he said to me, he said, what are you doing to me? What are you? I said, Stan, I'm not a golfer. He said, he said, well, you, you started off pretty well. I said, yeah. I said, just wait and see what happens. So, but he was, uh, he and his brother Bill, they used to, uh, they had taken over the Pearson Sporting Goods from Reds and Jack as far as doing the buying. So I used to call on both Stanley and Bill uh, when they were buying athletic footwear at, uh, you know, their main store, which is right in downtown Philadelphia. Probably the biggest store, big on, uh, big sporting goods store in Pennsylvania. I yeah, it was at the time. Yes, they were an independent, and they uh, controlled most of the business. And as a matter of fact, they had a huge amount of the team business in, in the Philadelphia area, both uh, professional and college. They dealt with the, you know, the Phillies and the Eagles and, and the Warriors at the time. And, um, oh, and the, the athletics. A's. Before that, the yeah, and the A's, right? They they were because they were <clears throat> they were right in the middle of Philadelphia on Chestnut Street, and uh, they were an independent one one store. And uh, as opposed to today, you've got you know multiple stores in these big boxes. But you know, Pearson's was an old line sporting goods store, three four stories, and uh, you know the the fact is that all the local 
athletes, coaches, and they would like to go in and, and talk with, you know, with Red and Jack and, and Bill and Stanley and, you know, talk about sports as well as the business. So I, I think I mentioned to you one time, too, I was in Pearson's making a call and I was going to get in the elevator and, and out steps, out steps uh, Joe Frazier. And, uh, you know, because they did a lot of boxing. And I said, oh, hey, hi, champ, how are you? And he said, hey, good, good to see you. And then, you know, went on his way. But that was the kind of clientele that they had at Pearson's. Uh, you know, quite a few uh, very prominent athletes were there. Well, you don't happen to know where he bought the lawnmower, though, that cut off his foot. Though. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. You know, there, there was, you know, speaking of lawnmowers, you know, remember the old story, and again, this dates us, but, you know, Kurt Simmons, when he was a great pitcher with the Phillies, you know, he chopped off his big toe, you know, cutting yeah. his lawn. I remember that, yeah. Oh, I yep. don't, don't remember right. that. Yep. But, uh, 1953, yeah. Well, Whoa. Didn't he come I bet he remembers it. Originally? Oh, I he does, too. <laughs> He's a boss baby with the Phillies. Oh, I'll yeah, well, he, he and he and Robin Roberts, Kurt and yeah. Robin Roberts, were the two mainstays of that Philly staff. And yeah, uh, yeah. matter of fact, and, and, you know, when the Whiz kids, when they won yeah. it, you know, Kurt, Kurt, and I'm sure yeah, he, got, he was we'll called remember. up the National Guard. Yeah, he had been called up September. during the season and, and yeah. couldn't even pitch in the World Series. I know. Yeah, in just the last month, uh, yeah, I, I did a project uh, a whole bunch of years ago. I presented a cyber meeting thirty years ago. On players who lost uh, time to uh, being in the military during Korea, right? Yeah, and he he's, well, that he happened wanted. to be you know that happened to be an interesting time for me because I was ten years old and I I, I mentioned before I had gone to the 1950 World Series game two and I watched Robin Roberts you know, yeah. lose to the Yankees uh, and DiMaggio hit a tenth inning home run yeah. but uh, a couple years later when I was in I think junior high school. I had an opportunity to meet Kurt Simmons personally because he came to our school to speak, and and my teachers and all they wanted to have a photograph of Kurt and myself, uh, you know, talking baseball. So you know, I, I had an opportunity to, to meet him, and then uh, quite a few years later, when I was in the athletic footwear business, I had an opportunity to meet Robin Robertson, son Dan, who had been the uh, longtime baseball coach at West Point. So you know, I had a a pretty good connection with uh, you know those those Phillies teams. Kurt Simmons uh, wound up with 193 wins in the, the year and change because he missed the entire 51 season. That right. cost him 200 wins. Probably cost him 200 wins. Yep. And he's one of seven he, players now that are still alive that uh, played in both the 40s and, and 60s. Is so he's that right? Wow. Well, well, Shane, Shane is, Robin, is Robin Roberts still alive? Or no, he died. No, he, he, he died. no, he passed away a few years ago. He died in 2010. Okay. He was 84. Hmm. Uh, uh, but Red Shanes was the eighth, and he passed away uh, a just while ago. Just he was 95. Yeah. yeah. Well, Robin uh, Roberts was a had a tremendous, you know, Hall of Fame career, great pitcher, very smooth, and then you know to compare him with the, the delivery of Kurt Simmons. Kurt Simmons was a great pitcher, but he had a herky-jerky delivery. Yeah, it was really a yeah. strange delivery. And I can remember watching him and saying, my gosh, you know, I don't know how anybody would ever, you know, look at him and say, how can you pitch that way? But he did. That was that was the way he did it. Robin Roberts uh, was the keynote speaker at the Sabre National in 1974 in, Ar in Arlington, Texas. And... Uh, it was 74, no, it had to be 94. It was 94 in, in Arlington, Texas, and he was uh, a total class act. And he he came out with an autobiography several years ago and said the reason was that he never got a job in uh, prof in, major, in organized baseball after his pitching career was over was uh, because he was the one who brought in Marvin Miller to the Players Association. <laughs> and he coached at... Uh, I think it was South Florida he coached baseball there for uh, quite a right. while. Yeah. Um, Who did you say that let was? Let me ask you this. Robin let Roberts was. This, George, yeah, I know. He uh, played uh, Marvin Miller. Marvin Miller, Miller, right. Yeah, I thought you said Arthur Miller. His name was Arthur I never Miller. forgave him for that, to be honest. Yeah. Well, Arthur Miller was with Marilyn Monroe at the time. If I no, Mar Marvin Miller. 
Yeah, we know. Yeah, we I just said there. I thought you said Arthur Miller. No, no. Yeah. Hmm. George, in a consent um, question, what's changed most about the athletic shoe business since you started until today, Nike notwithstanding? Well, I, I would say, you know, Ralph, just uh, we've talked about this, you know, before, but when I was in it, it, it was very innocent, very small uh, as far as, you know, what was going on. Everybody competed against one another, but they competed against one another with product. Uh, today, they're competing against one another with money. And uh, to me, that's been the major change. You know, when I was, was in it, uh, very few athletes were paid, very few coaches were paid, and the ones that were paid uh, by shoe companies were paid uh, just a nominal amount. And uh, I can remember going to ball games and going to clinics and camps, and, and we would actually sit there, myself, uh, Converse rep, uh, Adidas rep, whatever, and, and we'd count the number of shoes being worn by various players. And a, a big thing for us would, would be able to get a whole team uh, in your particular shoe. And uh, and it was all done really on, on friendship and, and associations and the fact that you got the chance to really work with a lot of these coaches and, and didn't have to go in with a with a checkbook and open up the checkbook and say, Here here's here's what it's gonna you know, here's what we're gonna give you this year. Uh today it's it's totally different. And you're you're seeing that the athletes, a lot of the NBA players, a lot of the college coaches are are making uh, huge amounts of money from the athletic shoe companies. So I would say, you know, to me, that's the basic difference from from the way the business was when I started. Okay. Now, when you would bring on coaches and players on your board, on your um, – yeah, We call them advisory team. Advisory team. Right. Am I right? Right, right. Okay. It would be – almost an honor to them in the school. It would um, give the school publicity, uh, give the program publicity. It was appreciated at, at the time. Am I correct? Yeah, it, it really was. I mean, that's how that's how innocent it was back then. Um, I mean, today you've got the Nikes and Adidas and, and the rest of them really, you know, fighting over the, the colleges and getting what they call a Nike school or an Adidas school or whatever. But but back then, uh, our our dealings were really <clears throat> with a basketball coach. He would be on our staff. We would pay him uh, a small amount of money, uh, supply about uh, 30, 40 pair of shoes, maybe 50 pair of shoes to the team, the basketball team during the season. And for that, the coach would represent us at clinics and camps in the summertime, and we would have a meeting once a year of all the coaches, all the coaches on our staff, and we'd have about a three-day meeting. About a day and a half would be for business, and the other day and a half would be to play golf, which most basketball coaches love to do. They love to play golf. So, you know, my responsibility was to set up the meeting uh, in conjunction with the, the coaches on our staff, and uh, we would do it once a year, probably in the middle of the summer. And, uh, you know, it was always a fun time for us to get together and, and talk business as well as, uh, you know, the basketball, you know, game itself because the coaches loved to be with each other and they would do X and O's and, you know, all kinds of stuff. And with us, we, were, we weren't doing the X and O part. We were doing the business part. It sounds like a working vacation that went on for, what, 30 years? <laughs> yeah, well, it was fun. I mean, I always looked forward to it, and the coaches did too. And uh, But it was sort of a, a compliment back then to them at the time because nobody really had put together a staff. Uh, we were the first. And then, uh, you know, Nike did it, Converse did it, and that kind of thing. But uh, when I was with Pro Kids, we were the first, and this was probably around 1970, 71. And uh, from that point on, you know, Nike really took off in basketball because they started to spend a lot of money. And I had mentioned before that one of the coaches that we had, I had was Denny Crum, who had been John Wooden's assistant at Louisville. And uh, Denny called me up one day. He said, George, he said, I just got an offer from from Nike. He said, you know, it's a huge amount of money. And I said, De I said Denny, take it. He said, because I can't even come close to that. And that was the hmm. start of uh, the escalation of the, of the, you know, money being spent on coaches. 
There was a man that couldn't win in taking over for for Wooden. He was a terrific coach. Gene Bartow. Yeah. Pardon me? Bartow. He came from, I think, uh, uh, UAB, Alabama, oh, Birmingham. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's that's what had happened. Actually, Denny Crum made a made a wise move strategically because he got away from uh, you know UCLA because it was very very difficult to follow. Like Alan mentioned, I mean Gene Bartow, he came from University of Alabama, Birmingham, and and was a great coach. But to follow in in Wooden's footsteps well, yeah, was follow, almost impossible. The worst thing is to follow a legend. Right. Yeah. So, you know, Crum, he developed his own, you know, reputation and legend in, in a basketball school at Louisville, but he got away from, uh, you know, the, the dark, I mean, not the dark, but the huge shadow uh, of John Wooden. And, and uh, for many years, he had been Wooden's assistant. Well, you would never, I mean, I knew it because I was in the business, but by and large, fans never knew anything about anybody other than John Wooden, the coach of UCLA. It was like that coach, Bankston, and uh Green Bay, uh, who followed them, body. I mean, he, you know, he, he just can't do that. Right. The best thing, though, is to be the legend. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Hey, George, did you ever work with Rick Majerus? I'm sorry, Alan, what was that? No, I didn't. Did you know ever work you with Rick Majerus? With, yeah, <clears throat> I didn't work with Rick personally. I mean, I think I mentioned to you, I knew him. And, yeah, and I knew, you know, he was at Marquette. I, I knew Al McGuire. Yeah. And uh, yeah. you know, Rick was a was a great basketball coach, and yeah, he's you true. would never you would never think about him being a basketball no. coach because he's no. a big no. heavy set he guy, like a big guy, big heavy right. set guy, yeah, right. But he was some coaching a great recruiter. Oh yeah, yes. Yeah, he and I went to high school together. We were good friends. Oh, did you? Right. Yeah, his parents were close friends with my parents. George, did you make inroads at all with the Celtics and their converse ties? Was that ever broken? Well, yeah, I did in a way. We had JoJo White, and uh, JoJo White wore our shoes. But basically, you know, uh, Bill Russell and, and Havlicek and and those Kuzi and Charm and those guys, they were in they, – they were converse. And back when uh, Kuzi and Charm and Russell – uh, they were wearing a low-cut black uh, Converse shoe, and then uh, later on they switched to suede, uh, green suede, and Dave Cowens and, and some of those guys were wearing Converse, and I was able to get uh, JoJo White, um, a great backcourt guy with the Celtics, and uh, JoJo wore We had a new uh, green suede basketball shoe that we made, and uh, it was in the Celtics colors, and, and we were able to have JoJo represent us for a couple of years. Yeah, Kuzi Did you talk to Orbach the back. along the way at, at no. any time? Did you get to know him? I never, I never got to know him personally. I mean, I know that he had a lot of ties, as David knows, with Washington. I think his uh, brother had, had done a lot of uh, cartoon work or something in the in the Washington area, and uh, you know, Red was born in in D.C. and uh, yeah. you know, I, I knew. I certainly knew of him and had met him, but but my recollection of Red was always, you know, his victory cigar at the, at the end of the Celtics win. Uh, that was his trademark. I mean, back, you know, today they would probably, you know, not uh, not allow it, but back then, right. I mean, he'd light up right on the bench. Sure, that's right. That was that's when you knew yeah. the game was over. Right. When, right. when Red lit up. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he went to GW here in the district. There was one game I was watching on TV a million years ago, of course. They were playing Baltimore. And for some reason, Baltimore only sent out four players to start the second half. So they asked our back after the game. You know, Celtics clobbered them and said, well, if they wanted to play with four, we would have let them. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, this is going to date all of us. And... um Bob Cousy turned 90. 90, yeah. Um, wow. That, I bet he can still shoot. I bet he can still shoot. Um, I don't think he'll lose it. You, you know, I mean, he may not be able to shoot from as far out as he used to, but I bet he can still sink him. Well, I'll tell you what, he and Charmin, I mean, I, I was privileged to, to watch both of those guys because I was in – you know, I was in junior high or high school at the time, and and I remember one of my teammates at, in high school. He had gone to Bob Cousy's camp, 
and he came back, and he was doing all kinds of tricks, going behind his back and everything else with the ball. I mean, stuff that's done today all the time. And I remember my high school basketball coach, he, he sat him down. He said, you know what? You just lost your starting job. Nobody plays for me. It dribbles behind his back. Guzzi <laughs> <laughs> was the first showman in the NBA. Oh, yeah. 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 And, but he was some player. Yeah, he never won anything until Russell came. And then after Russell came, he only was once. The rest, who's the only was once the rest of his career. Uh, I saw I saw Cruzy and Charmin play in a, in a, um, a charity game at Kutch's Country Club. They used to play a charity game each year for Marie Stokes, um, who yeah. crippled yeah. in an accident. And so they they all went up there. They used to play an East West game. And Cousy and Sharman were in the backcourt, and Russell was the center. And I forget who the other two forwards are, because it was not just the Celtics. But the other no, no. And then, and then uh, Chamberlain was on the other, uh, the other side. And they played it outdoors on a full-length court, a uh, concrete floor. And um, it, it was just terrific. I mean, Chamberlain, of course, worked there as a bellhop. And um, right. They have pictures of him. He could carry six bags under his arms, three on either side, oh my God. and nobody else can do that. <laughs> I think that's where Take My Wife first came into it. Well, was New York bred. He was born in Queens. He went to Andrew Jackson High School, and then he went to Holy Cross. And then, you know, the story about how he came to the Celtics is wild, because he was originally drafted by a team called the Chicago Stags. Uh, folded up after one, uh, uh, be, before he was uh, scheduled to play with them, so they put all they dispersed some of the, most of the players, and three could, they couldn't agree on three. They put them into a hat with the Knicks and the, six, the Warriors and the uh, and the, uh, the Celtics. So the Knicks drew first, and they drew Max Slavsky, who they wanted oh, yeah. he was Jewish and a uh, hot right. scorer at the time. The, six, the Warriors took Andy Phillip. And the Celtics were stuck with Cousy, who Auerbach didn't want in the first place. Auerbach uh, was criticized heavily for not uh, drafting Cousy when he came out because of the ties, uh, you know, with uh, the tie with Holy Cross. And Cousy wanted, uh, uh, Auerbach wanted the seven-foot center in Charlie Cher. So he wound up walking, walking into Cousy because of this dispersal draft and, and being stuck with him. And that's how Cousy went up. Wound up on the Celtics. Did Arbach try to contain him like uh, George's teammates was contained by his high school coach for his style? The style, no. Uh, uh, yeah, that was that he wasn't throwing the ball away, or t- you know, turning it over, or whatever. Uh, you know, Arbach was comfortable with it. Yeah, Auerbach had a great, really great was. eye for talent. Yeah. And um, he knew instinctively. Like, for example, when he drafted um, Tom Satch Sanders from NYU, I um, mean, most of us thought, and, and Al Bach will back me up on this, uh, we never thought he had a, st- a chance of making the Celtics. We figured it we figured that was a kiss of death uh, for Satch because he, he just wouldn't fit in with him. Well, of course he did. He became one of the premier defensive ball players in the NBA, and he had a great career with the Celtics. Go figure, you know. Yeah. yeah. And Barry, uh, you know what, Ralph? Ralph, you you mentioned about you know Kuzi. I mean, Kuzi had that that great knack and great talent to do that kind of stuff, and, and then later. You know, a guy like Pete Maravich. I mean, Maravich, there's a lot of his moves, you know, w- would be stuff that he had learned by just watching Kuzi going behind the back, you know, doing all the kind of dribbling and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, a coach like uh, like Arbach, he was not going to mess with Kuzi. That was his natural ability. Right, exactly. As long as he didn't turn the ball over. <laughs> but, yeah. Right. But, you know, there's a famous story. There's a famous story about Cousy just after he retired. I think he was going through the Connecticut Turnpike or one of the toll plazas there, and he threw his coin in the thing, and uh, it missed. And the attendant who was in the booth said, he retired just in time. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story, David. That's yeah. correct. <laughs> Well, he, he, um, he and Sean mentored, uh, mentored the Jones boys. Did you have much basketball in them, those yeah. days living in the Midwest? Um, oh, yeah. You had, the, oh, yeah. you had the Lakers, of course. Yeah, the um, Minneapolis Lakers, right. And the Fort Wayne Pistons. Mm-hmm. 
And the Rochester Royals? Well, I wouldn't call them away in the Midwest. That was New yeah, York. They played in the Western oh, Division. That's true, yeah. but I was yeah. just naming teams in the old days. And they sent the right. Milwaukee, no, no, the, but, the twice uh, yeah. the Milwaukee to St. Louis Hawks. The St. Louis Hawks, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. And Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne, they were called the Fort Wayne Zollner Pistons because Fred Zollner was the owner. Yeah, and right. Later yeah. became the Detroit Pistons. So, you know, you've got those teams that moved around from different cities, but they still, you know, kept the, the last name. So, you know, St. Louis Hawks, you know, had been, uh, you know, there with the Hawks and, and Atlanta Hawks and that kind of stuff. But the, the, my recollection of basketball, pro basketball, when I was a youngster, really was the, the early days of the, you know, National Basketball Association when they only had, what, I think it was eight, eight teams. Yeah. And, and, you know, and basically, yeah, you know they were in the you know the east and the, and the Midwest. That was about it. I think St. Louis was the yeah. further, just like in baseball, was the further right. west they went. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, the, you, you know the worst transition. Everybody knows, the, what, the you know worst transition in those days was the Utah Jazz, and they mm-hmm. came from New Orleans. And you say, what in the world is the relationship between Utah and the Jazz? Yeah, um, Memphis Grizzlies is the same thing. Yeah, there aren't many. Make Grizzly Bears be fun in Memphis. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. Okay, but, let me let me ask you guys, um, and and we'll go around the room with this. Was there any? Why did Maravich? Um, isn't he recognized as one of the all-time great? He's almost an afterthought. Why is that? Nobody won a no team that he was ever on won anything. Okay, and why do you think? They never, they never won anything. And when the St. Louis Hawks, had, the Atlanta Hawks at that time, had a team that they thought might be might challenge the Knicks, but they were all black. And when the, they brought in Maravich, uh, there's a big resentment. And Zabon Beatty and Joe Corvall j- jumped to the ABA. At the oh. time, and Mar- Maravich basically, uh, the, if you go on Facebook at the basketball sites, you find a lot of love for Maravich. How great he was! But you know, I'm, I'm a skeptic because you know, no team he was on was ever better because he was on it. But he was a bit of a like showboat no, too. Yeah, yeah sort of like Nolan Ryan. Yeah. He he was a pioneer in the sense that I think he came out with his instructional videos and I can't remember any player having done that before and he revolutionized the teaching part of basketball if I remember correctly his dad was a big basketball coach too wasn't he yeah, was. yeah he was yeah. His, his father his father's name was press press Maravich and they were from <clears throat> Aliquip of Pennsylvania I happen to know both of them and and I used to work with Press and Pete at their camp. But, but Press, uh, he became the coach at LSU, uh, he brought Pete down there, and, and Pete set all kinds of records at LSU. And then, you know, when Pete uh, went into the NBA, I mean, as you're talking about his instructional film, I mean, he could do stuff with a basketball that was just uncanny. I mean, he he was very much of an individual, but, but he was a person that, that had skills far and above anybody else. And... And what Alan's talking about as far as, you know, not bringing a championship, that's probably very true. But on the other hand, you know, Pete was an individual, and, and he learned uh, all these kind of skills. Actually, I can remember talking to the press. He said, yeah, he said when, when Pete was in high school and before that, he said he used to have a basketball in his hand constantly. Uh, you know, Pete didn't really have a lot of interest in, in academics. I mean, he was a basketball junkie, and he played basketball from a very early age. And then when he got into college and the pros, I mean, he learned to do things, you know, passing without looking, going between his legs, uh, doing all kinds of crazy shots uh, with his floppy socks, and that was his trademark. And uh, he was a, a terrific individual player who probably today, because Pete died at a very young age, he had a, mm-hmm. uh, a heart condition and, and dropped dead playing pickup basketball when he was only in his 40s. So, you know, he was very young. And a lot of people today, I mean, they probably young kids today, they, they wouldn't even remember the name of Pete Maravich. But back when he was playing, he was a major star. Yes, he was. His death sticks in my mind for the following reason. 
Yeah, he died. He was 42 or something like that. He died early. But when right before he did die, they asked him, how you doing? He just came off, as you said, George, playing pickup basketball. Right. He said, I had fun. This was terrific. I had a great day. And he dropped dead. Right. But you huh. could say that's a, that's tragic. He died young and and all of this, but uh, you know, he was he was having fun and um I, I don't know, I, I saw something redeeming. I remember something redeeming uh, about that. Um you know, you go out doing what you like to do. Um well, I think well, Rob's right. Us I think that's the way on the golf a lot of us a lot of us think that way. I mean, we would love to be doing something if if we're going to go and when we go, we we go doing something that we really like and and enjoy and has been part of our life and and that's the way it was with Pete. I mean, it was uh, you know, a real testament to him. I mean, if he was going to die, he was going to die playing basketball, which is the game he loved. Yeah, well, if I was going to die doing something I loved, I'd be in center field at the Yankee State at Yankee Stadium. You know, that's not going to happen, though. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you can't make it all happen. It'll happen in our dreams, though. That. Well, it might have happened if they still let people, if they still let the fans walk out through the center field exit, which no longer exists, then you have a chance of dying in the center yeah. field. Hey, David, da- David, now you are dating yourself because they don't do that anymore. I know that. I know that. <laughs> I, 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 one of the first times I was there. and uh, the one, It was a wonderful way to leave. I was totally dumbfounded that they allowed it. Oh, yeah. It was I always wanted to steal, steal one of those numbers that they used to put in for the auxiliary scoreboards. And they pulled oh, yeah. them back really quickly after the game. Yeah, I know, because yeah, I really wanted to see Because people like you would have stealing them. Yeah. <laughs> then they went electronic. Yeah, a guy like and, you. <laughs> they went electronic right. and made it. And a guy uh, like you, yeah. David, you would ask. No, I would, I, but I do remember I do remember at the polo grounds with the, where we had to go out that way for the, the teams to go up the stairs to the clubhouse. Yeah. Uh, I remember a kid grabbing uh, Duke Snyder's cap, and Snyder went after him and quickly you know, <laughs> tackled him to the ground and got his cap back. Um, in those days, they probably would have charged him for the lost cap. <laughs> Most, yeah. But he, boy, did he grab that kid quickly. Uh, yeah. And what did Charlie Silvera tell you, David? <laughs> but I, I was polite. I had asked him if he, I could have a baseball. Uh, and that would have broken my record of never having gotten a, a ball from a ballpark, which still exists, by the way. It's probably longer than anybody else's record. I've never gotten a baseball. No, I have a ball. So, so, uh, so I asked Charlie Silvera, who was warming up the pitcher, you know, can I have a baseball? And Silvera said to me, when you go to somebody's house for dinner, do you ask to take home the silverware? <laughs> And I wish I could tell him that story. He's still alive, but I. I yeah. Yeah. Do you guys, do you guys recall? It wasn't too long ago. It was on YouTube, I think, or something. There was a guy who caught a fa- who caught a ball in the stands, and his little girl was sitting next to him, and he he hands the ball to the little girl, and she throws it back on the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's another one that went viral of some kid that caught a ball. A ball, and the kid apparently had caught one in the previous game. He went uh, a few rows down and handed it to another kid. Yeah, that went viral. A colleague, a colleague of mine at Voice of America, when we, when we write Americana features, uh, uncovered the story of uh, uh, it, there was a, a, a guy in it was either the Polo Grounds or Ebbets Field. Um, who the ball was hit into the stands, and he refused to give it up. He refused to return it to the, and that was the start of allowing fans to keep the baseball. Um, he just said, "I'm not going to give it back," and he didn't. And they said, "Okay, you know," and um, that that was the start of the tradition. He wrote a whole script about it, um, and I, I don't remember too many of the details. Well, but, but uh, most of the teams after that, uh, you know, decide that would be a good PR. You know, yeah, that's sure. Okay. So, well, in dead ball, they used to use, you know, three baseballs a game in the dead ball era, and they were all smart. Right, and they wanted them back. And, uh, you know, I guess uh, after that, uh, you know, that is... And now, of course, they give them away. Now yeah. they give them away on, you know, a guy catches a ball in the outfield, he tosses yeah. it into the stands. Yeah. So, right. 
Yeah, so I think my chances of the public relations would be better if they didn't arrest people for that. They gave you know, let the people, the fans yeah. take the right. ball. But well, that I'm, took a I'm, long time. I'm ever optimistic yeah. now that as I go to Nat Stadium, I will get a baseball one of these days. My buddy actually who wrote that script, he he was famous for getting baseballs first at, at Oriole Park, first at, at Memorial Stadium, and then at Oriole Park. I mean, he would run down to the first row and get baseballs left and right, and I never... I never. The only time I got one was in, the, in 2000 uh, with the Sabre Commission. We, had, we were at a Florida State League game in Jupiter with uh, about 700 people and we Sabre members were about half the attendance. And a foul ball came right back to me, so I, I have that. That's yeah, but that does the minor that, league. That's, 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 minor league's not the category. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that's a whole different category. <laughs> yeah. You have to be, catch a major league ball. I was trying, <laughs> I, I, I was going, uh, leaving the, uh, walking in the old uh, Texas Rangers stadium, not this one, though, the one that they, you know, the beefed up my league stadium they had for the first number of years, and I reached my hand out to grab a baseball, and some kid, Kid almost took my arm off. Yeah, they get pretty vicious on that. But the, the worst scrambles I ever saw, the Steelers in the old days used to, after after uh, the Pirates vacated Forbes Field, they used to play their games in Forbes Field. And w- one of the end zones is right before the center field fence. They would kick the ball over the center, you know, the field goals and extra points over the the wall. And, you know, me and my friends are staying, standing around to wait to get into halftime when they open the gates so we can get, get into the game at halftime for nothing. And uh, these kids, when the football came over the wall, they, these kids would kill each other. I never got involved with that because these kids were maybe 10, 11 years old. They they kill each other for the football. Yeah, that may be why they put those screens up now. Yeah, I'm sure there were about seven or eight people coming uh, in after 1950 saying that they had Mazeroski's home run ball. Oh, yeah, I'll bet. Because that yeah. went over the wall, yeah. Which is just the anniversary of which is just yesterday, the day before, somewhere in the yeah, There was a book that came out a few years ago uh, by some guy who spent uh, a lot of time trying to trace the Bobby Thompson ball. Well, that, that was the Don DeLillo book. Um, it's all in the Don no, DeLillo this was a, this was a uh, This was a nonfiction thing. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. the, the, the Lila wrote this great novel. Um, yeah, and, and the yeah, name of which guy, escapes me for the time. So we pictures of the ball, you know, close-up pictures of the ball going into the stands, and trying to figure out, uh, you know, he and his father had a lifelong chase after that baseball, and they finally got what they thought it was, and it wasn't. So, uh, you know, the book ended. Uh, uh-huh. yeah, ended with, you know, the guy said, yeah, the, I think that's the no way no way of identify a nun as yeah. having caught that ball. Yeah. And um, oh. they tried to trace her down, and they never really completed the... Yeah, the book uh, came out in 2009 because I bought it at the bookstore in Washington when I was down there for the convention. Sabre Convention was in Washington. That I, year. That's when I bought that book uh, at the convention. So that's when it came out, 2009. That's of course, now that they've extended the screens, in the yeah. it's, uh, it's, you know, the, the fans behind the screens now have no chance of getting yeah. baseball. They don't, they don't, but, you know, my opinion, it's the right thing to do because... Oh, yes, I agree. ...some tragedies. I mean, the, yeah. the ball hit off a line drive. I mean, a, the ball hit off the end of a bat goes back there so fast, and, and the little girl, she had, what, her skull fractured? I mean, there's oh, yeah. people maimed and killed. I mean, that that was a very sure. dangerous yeah, thing. Yeah, so, very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. So people, it's, that ball it's, was totally broken up. Yeah, it's but people who don't pay, pay attention to the them with game. the medical bills, you know, and everything. He, was re- he said, I have two kids of my own. Yeah, it's just, well, it was, he, yeah, he, he really, yeah. really uh, you know, felt horrible about that happening. Right. I was in the, the uh, uh, one of the loges, you know, one of the uh, luxury boxes at uh, the Cleveland Stadium, the new one, the new, uh, which cha- its name changes. And uh, somebody hit a foul. The, the windows were wide open because it was a nice uh, evening, uh, autumn evening. And uh, the ball came flying up, and it hit a woman in the next uh, luxury box over, and she went down like a shot. And, uh, but she, you know, people in those boxes, they don't pay attention to the game. They're eating, they're yeah. schmoozing, they're talking. 
And the same thing out on down on the field. In the field, they're mostly looking at their cell phones. That's right. how some, they get some, Yeah, somebody uh, posted a, uh, an event on Facebook of Richie Ashburn hit the same woman with foul balls twice and won it back. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Now, he was great fouling balls off. You know, he could do that. Yeah, he was. All day. He was. Like, yeah. him and Luke Kaplan, the two I know, that could stand there. You know, in those days, you know, he would run up pitch counts. Well, they did, Alan. No, they, they, had bat, no, they had bat control. Those those two guys were not interested in, in seeing if they could hit one into the seats. I mean, they, they were up yeah. there to, to get on base, and uh, that's what they did. So, yeah. you know, and Richie and, and, and uh, you know, Appling both. I mean, they were singles hitters. They they weren't power hitters, even yeah, though, you know, Appling, Appling, the old-timers game, I know, hit one out against Spine. Yeah, but that was I was there. I saw that. Situation. Yep. The, the thing is that they didn't uh, keep track of pitch counts back then. Right. You know, Ashburn could run uh, pitches, uh, one pitcher up to 13, 14 pitches. Oh, yeah, times. absolutely. But they didn't, track, they didn't track that uh, back then. Well, somebody told me it might have been one of you guys, probably was, about Luke Appling's experience with Comiskey, and he hated Comiskey. And what he would do is... Uh, not not Charlie, would... he was dead by then. Oh, okay, okay. There's the son, the Lewis. Yeah. All right. He hated Lewis Comiskey, and he would yeah. foul balls off on purpose because it cost the, the team big bucks or X <laughs> number of bucks per ball. And if he'd get mad at, at the owner, he just foul balls in, into the seats. and give Well, for 20 money. years, he and the Ted Lyons, the pitcher, were the only reason, reasons for anybody to go out there. I've, I've, I've posted that a number of times. When I see pictures of Luke Appling the Ted Lyons, I said, you know, Luke was one of the two reasons, he and Ted Lyons were the only reasons to go out to that ballpark for 20 years. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, your dad was much the same kind of hitter as Richie Asburn, George. Yeah, he, he was. My, my dad had really good back control. He, he wasn't, I can't recall him being really do, doing, uh, you know, the, the, the foul ball bit, but he, he could certainly, he was a good bunner and, and just like Ashburn, and that's what a leadoff guy was supposed to do. He was supposed to be able to get on base. So, you know, my dad was right-handed, Richie was left-handed, but the fact is they both had very good back control and were both very good bunners. And we've talked fact, about today, that before, there was an today. article. Very few guys know how to bunt today. So there was a big so article in the Daily News today by Bill Madden about the Oakland A's, who are you know astounding everyone right now. They have not bunted this entire season. Well, wow. that was yeah, in the article. Incredible. I didn't know that until I read the article. Yeah. That's amazing, now, and I yeah. mean that truly is well, amazing. It shows you what's happened to the game. If if guys are, if has. no team has bunted all year, I mean that's just unbelievable. Right. The Saber metrics. Is that unbelievable? The, the, the metric, Saber metrics people hate the bunt. I know. Yeah. Well, they can hate it all they want, and I'm, a, I'm a former Saber guy, but I don't. I don't believe in those kind of stats. I don't like them. To me, you know, why. if the situation calls for a bunt, I agree you bunt. with you, George. I agree with you. I, I, I tell I tell people when I, they say Saber or Saber metrics, I said I'm not one that believes in war. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's well, the old well, song, war good for absolutely nothing. I think it's yeah, I mean, uh, but th- unfortunately, sabermetrics has been the name given to all these crazy stats that they all go by now. Right. Yeah. So you have to differentiate, you know, being a member of Saber as to, uh, you know, and adhering to, to all that, that nonsense. Yeah. Well, Saber has always looked into the unusual way of doing things, and I don't think we could uh, not talk, speaking of unusual, about how Tampa Bay is revolutionizing how normally pitching pitchers stay in rotation, they're bringing in relievers to start the game, and they're at least... Um, if if not having a championship team, at least they're pushing the button a little. They're staying over 500, and um, yeah, it just goes to show you changes are being made in the game um, yeah. all the time. So you look at the age. Quite a bit lately. 
Well, almost every single player on the A's was under the radar. Uh, the, the payroll was $82 million, which is uh, about half of what Houston's payroll is, and uh, yeah, they're tied with them right now. Yeah, and they've had yeah. four guys go on, four pitchers have Tommy John surgery. Four, four of the five starters went down with injuries, and they've mm-hmm. recouped. They brought back Cahill and Anderson, two guys that came up with them who have been hurt on and on in their careers. They're staying healthy. They brought a guy in, uh, Jackson, I can't th- think of his first Edwin. One. Edwin. It is in Austin. The Giants no. brought him in, for, um, and he's re- or, or the Mets brought him from the Giants. But Edwin Johnson is uh, Jackson is putting together a year. Um, as far as the young players, they have a third baseman, Matt Chapman, who is absolutely a whiz defensively. He's the second best third baseman, fielding third baseman in, in the majors. To Arianato, the, the kid with the call, with Colorado, um, this guy is terrific. Uh, Simeon is coming on as a shortstop. Lowry, Lowry's having a terrific year as a second baseman. Made the All Star team. Uh, Matt Olson is uh, up and coming slugger and a terrific defensive first baseman. Um, they're a team to be reckoned with. I can't under everybody's surprised, but you know, it's uh, there are some GMs that come up with it year after year. Billy Bean has gotten more wins out of fewer bucks, more bang for the buck than any GM in baseball over the last 15 years. It, um, they're they're a story. And it, it's nice. Now they've got to put a ballpark in place, which is supposedly an announcement is coming out um, either before the end of this season or before the end of the fis- of the actual year as to finalizing a deal. Um, anyway, uh, what a hmm. nice show. This has been terrific. This has been fun. Anybody have any thoughts that... Um, Left hanging. Start with you, Ronnie. No, I don't. I I really enjoyed the show. It was a lot of fun. Okay, we enjoyed having you. Uh, Thank you, David Hubler. You want to complete anything so you're not cut off? No, I just think um, I, I, one interesting side side note for me personally is that um, I have a burial plot in the same cemetery as Red Alvac, and he's already there. By the way. <laughs> okay. Well, that doesn't mean you have to use it because you haven't. No. Well, I'm very frugal when it comes to things like that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Once you get, once you're in, you're in for a long time. So. Yeah, you yeah. are. All right. right. Uh, you'd be surprised how time flies when you're dead. <laughs> and, and not, ha- and at that point, not having fun. So. No, 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 you never hey, know. Ralph, you never know. Ralph and, and David, uh, it's George. I, I just wanted to mention one thing. When, when David was talking about a burial plot, and we, we had discussed it briefly a few minutes ago, Yankee Stadium walking out the center field. Uh-huh. <laughs> I remember somebody <clears throat> said to me not too long ago, I said, oh, when I was a kid, we'd walk out through center field at Yankee Stadium, and I always thought that Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig, and and uh, Miller Huggins, uh, that they were buried in those. Oh, yeah, but the monuments. Yeah, they did look like they did look like tombstones. Yeah, I just I just had to laugh when I heard it. I say, you know, because I I could understand it, but but that was obviously they were erected to honor them. That had nothing to do with their their burial. Their lot. Burial. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, there was one one movie where the the villains uh, died on on the pitcher's mound at uh, Dodger Stadium, and that was the end of the movie. I don't remember anything else about it, but he died with his head on the rubber. <laughs> One of you guys said that those monuments weren't in play. I think they were. They were. Oh, they yeah. They were in play. Oh, yeah. Absolutely, Absolutely they, they were play. in play. Yep. Yep. Mm-hmm. So, boy. Yep, yeah, balls were hit a couple times. Balls were hit behind the monument. That's the right. They had to run behind the monument, pick it up, and make the, you know, make the throw. They were definitely in play. They were in yep. deep center field at Yankee Stadium. Yes, they were. The 481, in front of the 481 song. Yep. Right. Yeah, when I was younger, I thought that 
Frankie Crusetti was coaching third base so long, I thought that they were going to bury him under the third base coaching box. <laughs> yeah, he was there, and Bill Dickey was it coaching first. Yeah, yeah but uh, Crusetti was there forever. I mean, oh, yeah. He was. Yeah. yeah. Right. He had, a, he had a lot of World Series rings from yeah. being in the third base box. That's, That's right. <laughs> hey, I'll bring up what your hero Yogi said, Al, Al Blomkin, about Bill Dickey. Yeah, he learned them all his experience. Learned them all his experiences, yeah. Or something like that. Miss Yogi. Yeah, Yogi said that uh, if you you if you don't go to other people's funerals, they won't come to yours. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we all everybody misses him. Yeah. Yep, they do. Everybody, yeah. All right, guys. Great show as usual. We'll see you next thank week. You. Same time. Okay, thank you yep. all. This is terrific. Bye bye. See you at the same time. What? Okay. Bye bye, everybody. Bye. All right. Adios, everybody. See you soon, David. And uh, take care, guys. Thank you for listening, everybody. It's the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. In case you're wondering, with George, George Case. Adios. We are back. Golenbach University. I'm Ralph Tycho of the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network. And the man, the myth, and the legend is with us today, Peter Golenbach. How are you, sir? I, I'm just fine. Just fine. We had an interesting ball game, the Tampa Bay Rays, against the Boston Red Sox today. Um, as oh. you know, the Rays had traded Eovaldi to the Red Sox, and he had been pitching marvelously for us. In exchange, we got back a kid who was in AAA by the name of Jason, uh, um, uh, his name is Beeks is his last name. I'm not even sure what his first name is. It's something yeah. like Jason, something like Jalen, I think, Jalen Beeks. And, um, you know, it's it's very, very interesting. Uh, because when you make a trade like that, the team that's trading the minor leaguer really has no idea how that minor leaguer is going to perform on the major league level. I mean, the reason the teams make the trade for a veteran like Eovaldi is they kind of know what they're getting. The problem is that if they sort of misjudge what they're trading away, uh, they may come to regret it in that it's turning out that this Jalen Beeks is just, he's just marvelous. The kid is, the kid is young. He's, he's like 23, 24 years old, but he's got the head of a veteran. He's cool as a cucumber. He throws a fastball 97 miles an hour. He's got a fabulous, not only off-speed pitch, but he's got a curveball, which, which is to die for. And to watch this kid pitch, you just marvel. Um, and in today's game against the Red Sox, uh, the Rays, which have been, which have been doing some fairly unorthodox things, so, so the idea being now um, with the Saber metric is that you don't want your starter to face the lineup three times. And so what the, the Rays have been doing is taking one of their bullpen guys, one of their 97, 98 mile an hour bullpen guys, and pitching them in the first and second inning. So Beeks. Started, I believe, in the third inning today. He gave up two hits in four innings. And he ended up winning the ball game. And the Rays ended up shutting out the most powerful Red Sox by a 2 to nothing score. And it was just thrilling. It was absolutely thrilling to watch. You know, the old David and Goliath. Uh, and this kid is just going to be terrific. Is there anything new on the ballpark uh which is the major issue for team. Uh, the only thing new on the ballpark um, is that um, they have designed it, so they know what it looks like, and it's quite beautiful. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only problem they have is they're lacking about $850 million uh, from state and county and city government to pay for it. So uh, are they negotiating uh, that, or, or I don't know what they're doing. I, I truly, I don't know. They've got until December 31st to raise the money, uh, and this is in Tampa. They're moving the raise from St. Petersburg, which they have been since the start, 
over to Ybor City in, Saint, in, in, in Tampa, uh, the notion being that over there, there are more uh, potential fans within, uh, you know, an hour of driving than there are in St. Petersburg. Uh, whether that's going to end up making a difference, I don't know, because I suspect uh, six or 7,000 St. Petersburg, you know, season ticket holders are going to decide to go to, you know, 20 games instead of 80. So they have to make that up. Um, right. I don't know what's going to happen. Nobody seems to know what's going to happen. The only thing I know is that this is a team right now that has totally remade itself in the most fascinating, fascinating way. Uh, they've got Matt Duffy at third, and they've got C.J. Crone at first, and they have Kiermaier in center, and they made a trade for Tommy Fan from St. Louis, and he seems like he's going to be a very fine ball player. Everybody else, for the most part, is a rookie. Just about the entire pitching staff are rookies. It's amazing. If there are 12 of them, there are 11 rookies and Sergio Romo, who was our closer, which drives right. everybody crazy because Sergio throws the ball at about 82 miles an hour, and we all wonder as he's pitching in the closer role how in the hell he can get anybody out. But he's got, you know, 17 saves. He got another one today. He got his 100th save for his career. Uh, and we beat the Red Sox 2 to nothing. So right, You can you know, rest, you, rest you, assured he has the um, game experience. He was the without a doubt. Also with the Giants when, the, yeah. uh, w- when they won. So he's afraid of absolutely nothing. No, he's real. That helps. He, he just doesn't have the speed that all these other guys have. I mean, we have five or six relief pitchers who throw the ball literally between 96 and 100 miles an hour. They are all rookies, and they are learning the, learning their craft very, very quickly. This is going to be a team to be reckoned with very, very soon, if not right now. Okay. Um, what's their record right now? Are they what? Three they're about over? two. They're two, three games, two, three games over, over 500, like 63 and 60, something like that, close to that. Right. Okay. Uh, but all they need, all they need to do is go on, you know, against Kansas City and some of these other lesser teams to go on a, you know, 10 or 12 game winning streak, and pretty soon they're going to be climbing up towards the Seattle's, um, you know, if not, if not the Oakland's and the Yankees. Peter, so we'll do see. they have a solid catcher coming up in the minors? They have a solid catcher right now, a fellow by the name of Perez, uh, who they got from, let me guess, uh, Arizona. I don't know. They, pay, he, he, they picked this kid up in one of the trades, and he is spectacular. He's a marvelous catcher. Because they're going to be missing Wilson Ramos. Uh, well, they'll be missing Wilson Ramos, but if this kid does what he looks like he's going to do, uh, they're not going to be missing him much. I mean, this kid was was the fourth or fifth catcher hidden behind other people, and so he never got the opportunity. And so when the Rays front office had the chance to grab this guy, they they did, and he looks terrific. The pitcher swear now, by him, and he's he's been in the, he's been in the game, he's been here about three weeks, so that says a lot about the guy. If if that isn't an example of the advantages of free agency and players not being stuck behind other players, uh, for some of them in the old days, their whole career was spent. Imagine being behind Lou Gehrig. Yeah, imagine being yeah. behind Yogi Berra. Yogi right. Berra played from 1947 to 1966, 65, yes. 66. Can 60, you imagine that? 64, 64 I guess. With he was Yankees and yeah. then went out to play a few, a few games with the Mets after. Yeah, but that, that just a couple of games. But, right. but you can name, you could literally name ten catchers in the major leagues who were out there uh, because the Yankees, you know, traded them away. Oh, uh, All sorts Gus of Fiandos, Gus, yeah. Lawler. Oh, exactly. Uh, these are guys that brought, what a farm system they had no at question. that time. Absolutely. To say nothing of guys that played behind Yogi like Charlie Silvera. Well, Charlie and, Silvera seemed to have that job for you know 15 years. 
Right. So Silvera, Silvera I mean, people don't don't really appreciate how indestructible Yogi Berra was. I mean, I do believe you know, Casey. Casey seemed to believe that Yogi was the most valuable player on that team. He called Yogi my man, which mm-hmm. was interesting because, of course, they had Mickey Mantle, they had Whitey Ford, they had Roger Maris. But uh, you know, as far as as Casey was concerned, the most important Yankee was Yogi Berra. Yeah, and um, actually, if you think about it, the most important Yankee was Casey Stengel. This man had the ability to come up with hunches, with platooning, with yep. the instructional league, with um, un- unbelievable character. He was a brilliant you, man. Um, regret not writing a book about uh, about Casey. Well, Casey was, you know, filled my entire dynasty book with with anecdotes. Casey was there from 1949 to 1964. 60. So I had, I had plenty of I had plenty of Casey. The one regret that I had was that I was I called Casey on the telephone. This was 1974, and I wanted to interview him. I wanted to come to his house and interview him. And we talked on the phone for about 15 minutes. And quite frankly, I truly didn't understand one thing that he was saying. He had dementia. <laughs> It just absolutely made no oh, sense. He, 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 and he was talking about his wife, who also had dementia. I mean, it was it was just oh. so bizarre. And then at the end, he said to me, "And if you come, make sure you bring five hundred dollars." So, so I'm thinking to myself, "Wait a second. I mean, is this guy out of his mind, or is he just you know sort of putting me on?" Um, but I, I sort of had the sense that. That really, that um, his his mental state at the time really wasn't worth my coming all the way across the country to see him, and so I didn't. Right, but that's very interesting from a man who owned the Glendale Bank. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. His that's wife that. was apparently a daughter of a banker. That's right. She Did was. Him right. And yep. It, it it's amazing in life. Um, and I could think of Carmen Berra, uh, mm-hmm. a good, strong marriage and a good, strong um, uh, un- undertow, you know, that, that basic thing that people have. Uh, it's really important. And um, Well, it's what differentiates. To note how some of these players end right. up with absolutely nothing. Correct. And um, Yogi, a good example of Yogi. somebody who... Yogi had a palace. I went to his house. It was a mansion. He had his Carmen was this beautiful, wonderful woman. He had a bunch of really terrific kids. Um, you know, and this was the guy who was supposed to be stupid. And believe me, he wasn't stupid at all. No. Uh, Whitey remained married to his wife for many, many years until now. Uh, and then, of course, there was there was Mickey and and Billy Martin, who had different situations. Um, they had the roving eye. They were more of alcoholics than than the others were, uh, and their their lives away from the game were you know terribly disrupted. Which is of not to say three, that, that who, who led who led them astray. Billy didn't particularly lead Mickey astray, and White no. They all, no. they all had their complicity in, in their um, ex, escapades and um, adventures. I, I don't think Billy got a lot of heat. Uh, George Weiss, I think, traded him away more right. for that than anything else. But George, Weiss, I don't George, that... Weiss, George Weiss hated Billy because Billy got to the Yankees, not because of Weiss. He got to the Yankees because of Stengel. Uh, Billy had played for Casey Stengel in Oakland. Right. And uh, the last season that Casey was the manager in Oakland in 1948, before he went up to the Yankees, uh, he said to Billy, you play one more season in Oakland, and I will bring you to the Yankees in 1950. And Casey was a good to his word. He brought Billy up in 50. And, and Weiss, who did some research on the players, wife, Weiss, 
you know, put a private detective on Billy and found out that Billy was, you know, something of a thug. Billy would go into a bar in Berkeley, uh, and for the fun of it, he would, you know, beat somebody up. You know, Billy liked hitting people. And, and George just did not think that this was, you know, fitting the image of the New York Yankees. But Billy was protected by Casey Stengel. He was uh, he was Casey's boy, you know. He was until the Steve Martin. Yeah. So and 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 Billy played on the Yankees from 1950 till June of 1957. And you know there was this fight at the Copacabana where Hank Bauer punched out some drunk because the drunk uh, called Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, the N word. And uh, the Yankee players were sick of listening to people calling Ellie Howard the N word. And well, I think basically... Howard was present at that. No, he wasn't. Um, he wasn't no, there. Johnny Cooks was there. Bauer was there. Mickey was there. Yogi was there. And Whitey was there. It was those five? They were there. And okay. uh, and uh, but but uh, Hank took this guy into the bathroom and beat the beat the crap out of him. And and, they, and and Weiss, who, who like I said, hated Billy Martin, uh, always was on the lookout for an opportunity to get rid of Billy. But he couldn't do it until he could find a player uh, as good as Billy. And that happened in 1957 when Bobby Richardson was setting the world on fire uh, in Kansas City with AAA in the Yankee system. Right, and so they. And it was Triple A indeed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, or he might have been Stanford. Now, come to think of it, I, I think I think I think uh, Bobby may have been in Denver, uh, right? Because the Kansas City uh, Philadelphia A's moved to Kansas City, so they were the Kansas City A's at the time. In fact, the team that that George Weiss traded Billy Martin to, I believe, was the Kansas City A's. Right, it and didn't they, stop. They even for, though for they were a major season. league team, it didn't stop them from being a minor league team for the Yankees. Well, in that case, in that in that particular case, uh, the owner of the Kansas City team uh, was a close friend of Dan Topping's, and so he always felt that the Yankees would do right by them. And as a result, the Yankees picked off all of the A's greatest players, including people like Ryan Duran, Roger Maris. Uh, and, and, and traded them sort of their rejects. Though, you know, Norm Seaburn was a perfectly decent player, uh, and, and, you know, a number of the players traded over to Kansas City were perfectly, perfectly good players. I don't know if I read this in your book. I probably did. But when the Cleveland Indians dealt Roger Maris to Kansas City, mm -hmm. uh, the reaction on the Yankee bench was, we just got Roger Maris. Well, I think <laughs> the reaction. I think the reaction, quite frankly, all over the league was that, um, and, it, and 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 the reaction was disgust. I mean, absolute yeah. disgust. Oh yeah. Um, it, yeah, rooting for the Yankees, they used to say, was like rooting for U.S. Steel. Absolutely, um, it, it, it was. Um, the Yankees had money. I mean, it's not entirely different right now from the way the Yankees are right now. Uh, the Yankees make $700 million uh, from their Yes Network alone. And the Rays right. make something like, you know, $5 million from their TV and radio rights, though in the next couple of years that's going to change and they're going to make a hell of a lot more money. Um, but but the Yankees, it isn't always yeah. the most money. Uh, no. That's what makes it interesting. Look at the A's that's right. this year. A fraction of the payroll of the Yankees, and they're competing for that wild spot, a wild yep. wild spot. Um, Oakland, Oakland's got a marvelous team, just a terrific, terrific team. This Cahill pitching today was just fantastic. I know, uh, and got, when you consider that four out of five of their starters have been on the D, have been out Tommy yep. John surgery. That's right. They, Cahill, Anderson, Jackson. Yeah. Um, they've well, rebuilt Jackson's the, a retread. The Jackson, Jackson's sort of a fill-in. He's a retread. He, he used to pitch for the Rays. 
Right. He's kind of a 500 pitcher, though I must say he's been pitching very well this year. Right, and Cahill and Anderson both started out with Oakland, mm-hmm. have been troubled with injuries all the all these years, yeah. and it's nice that they come back, stay healthy with the A's, and um, it's a fun team to watch. Just like the two teams, uh, Tampa Bay and Oakland, uh, we've talked for two years now. They've really mirrored each other with their service, with getting a ballpark. Yeah. Oh, right. And base. Um, it's been interesting and fun to watch them develop. Uh, um, Without a doubt. For both, for both of yep. us. Um, yep. And, that's a, and I'm glad Tampa Bay has a catcher to replace Ramos because I was thinking, that, the, um, you know, they um, got a lot, a lot of prospects, but Wilson is um, – probably the best player they gave up no question about it but let me tell you why they gave him up and and it's something that 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 i don't think most people realize yet but soon they will what the brain trust of the tampa bay rays has begun to realize is that when you hit the age of 30 in baseball today you are over the hill And the reason why you are over the hill at age 30 is that these pitchers now, and I mean almost every single one of them, except Sergio Romo, throw the ball between 97 and 100 miles an hour. We got this kid Glass now. Glass now started pitching uh, in the game uh, either today or yesterday. I guess it was yesterday's game. And he's throwing with such ease at 99 and 100 miles an hour. And this guy Beeks today was throwing 98, 99, 100 miles an hour. Now, once upon a time, I got in a batting cage to try to hit 90-mile-an-hour balls, and I fouled off three of them out of about 30 pitches. But that's not. You felt good fouling them off. I know I've done that, too. I was scared to death. My my knees were knocking. But the point is that was 90. That's not 97. 97 is like twice as fast as 90. And and you've got major league ball players trying to hit that, and so if you don't have the reflexes to do it, and I'm just getting the feeling looking at the batting averages of so many players who are hitting under 200 right now, that when you're over 30 years old, you're done, and you're going to see fewer and fewer and fewer long-term contracts for players who are say 29 and 30 years old, because those teams will get rid of you when you hit age 30 rather than sign you to a long-term contract. And I don't care who you are. So, basically, they're playing the odds that... Uh, at they're playing the, the statistics. Out. They're playing the statistics is what they're playing. They're seeing that hitting a baseball at 97, 98, 99 miles an hour takes a young guy to do it. Right. But, two... Um, in defense of Romo's 82, yep. pitching is the art of deception. So um, I, I think the, everybody throwing over over 95 is fine for a while, and then a team will come along with three starters that throw like Romo and win, and it'll go the other way. because Well, the problem is going to be, that the scouts are going to stop looking at people who throw, say, less than 95. Used to be, if you, if, right. you couldn't, if, you, if you couldn't throw a fastball as much as 90, they didn't look at you. You know, you, yeah. you, and now you, it's, you, no now one's it's looking 95. at the crafty little 5'10 guy or Whitey Ford. Yeah, well, uh, why, Whitey, Whitey, Ford, Whitey Ford will go play tennis. In this day and age, Whitey Ford go play tennis or golf. Right. They're, they're not looking at Whitey Ford anymore. He doesn't even get drafted. It, it's a power game right now. It's it's power pitching and home runs is what it is. Yeah. Hey, off the subject just a little bit, but on the subject of Whitey Ford. Uh huh. You remember when getting a complete game was everything in baseball in the fifties, early sixties. 
Well, I remember I, when it was common. It was common. It was m- much more common. The, oh, yeah. The, guy the, Robin, the Robin Roberts. Yeah, the Robin Robertses, the early wins, the Whitey Fords, the great pitchers were great pitchers because they pitched complete games without and, a doubt. And Whitey Ford and Louis Arroyo mm-hmm. started teaming up where Ford started pitching like only six innings. He, um, he had some nerve problem and what happened. Yeah, it was a little bit more than that. It was a little bit more than six innings, but but oh. you're right. You know, Arroyo, that one year in 1961, if you look him up, he had a record, I believe it was 18-1, and one, if you can imagine, right. for a relief pitcher. That, that's just astounding. And it, 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 really astounding. Brought, it really brought on the age of specialization, the way I see yes. it. In the, yes. in the bullpen. Well, you started you started getting relievers, the Dick Radishes from Boston, um, the the Orioles. The Orioles had that fabulous knuckleballer, Hoyt uh, Wilhelm. Um, yeah, Hoyt Wilhelm, without a doubt. Uh, teams yeah. started developing closers, but their closers didn't just pitch the ninth. The closers back then just when the when the starter ran out of gas whether it be, you know, six and a third or seven and, and two-thirds, at that point when the starter ran out of gas, the manager would bring the closer in, and he'd close out the game. Now, Absolutely. somewhere along the line, you know, if you look at Mariano Rivera, who was pitching in the 90s, somewhere on the line it, it then developed where your closer only pitched the ninth inning and only pitched right. in the ninth inning. Raleigh Fingers kept. and Eckersley and those guys, they yeah. were pitching three yeah. or four innings to get. Yes, they would. Um, yes, that, uh, so that just right there is uh, the evolution of the bullpen, just uh-huh. the way you, you described it right there. No question. Okay, and I'll tell you what, your biggest right fear now, tonight is you wouldn't be able to find anything interesting to talk about. Poo poo to that, Peter. Go <laughs> Well, you have a great right. week, Ralphie. I'll you talk too, to you, my soon. friend. All right. Thank you. Take care. Adios. Thanks for listening, everybody.